I just want to um, honour Bill and Agnes, actually, because obviously, as you know, I've not been speaking for a while or doing anything, <laughs> but Bill and Agnes have held the fort and they've been so incredibly faithful, really, and I really appreciate it. And we honour you for that because you're just so, you're a power. These are both powers in the house and we really appreciate that. And, yeah, so <clears throat> I like to speak today actually on kind of two things, but basically one about holiness. Because <laughs> I've been asking the question, like maybe many of us, about what is missing? Why are we not seeing revival? Why are we not seeing miracles, signs, wonders like we should? And I've been on a, a journey where God took me to the Hebrides, I've told you this before, I think, in the Isle of Wales, six times two years ago, three years ago now, because of the COVID thing. And God began to unfold all these things about the things that are missing, the things we need. One of them was the fear of God, the other one's holiness, there's obviously other aspects, prayer. And <clears throat> I actually got something a few weeks ago while Alec was speaking, and I just want to touch on that first before I go into kind of holiness, but it's all connected. And it's to do with an open heaven, this part here, to do with an open heaven over a region. How do we have an open heaven over a region? How is that going to happen? Is it going to happen by just our good ideas and programs and strategies and we just work hard and go out there and evangelise in their own strength and their own, <clears throat> their own ideas? Is that how it's going to happen or is it some other way? And I just want to read the baptism of Jesus, first of all. Amen. And it says this. I got this while I was speaking. I don't know if you remember. Two weeks ago, I think it was. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptised by John. John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to, be, to do this to fulfil all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, in whom I, am, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. I've read this a million times. And it's all about the open heaven and the Father speaks and the dove comes and the Spirit of God comes on Jesus. But what I never focused on was the part of Jesus being baptised. Jesus said, I've got to be baptised. Why? He was being an example of something. And I think we don't realise what it means to be truly baptised into Christ, truly, truly baptised into the nature and divine nature and character of Christ. You'll understand this in a minute. Let me just read Romans 6, verse 3 to 12. And it says this, because this is to do with baptism. Well, how is this connected to revival? And how is this connected to an open heaven? It says, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father... Even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. Now, we can just read that at a very surface level, how you're dead to self and you've been saved and salvation comes, and that's fantastic. But what I'm getting to understand more and more is that as we are dead to self, God has got something far greater than just revival. And Christ was being shown us an example when he was being baptised of someone who is completely yielded, surrendered to his Father. 
And when we are born again, and often it doesn't seem to happen right away, I don't know why. Maybe it's because, who knows, we've no good understanding of the true gospel. The true gospel is that we can be completely, utterly dead to self. And what I'm trying to say is, and what I believe God has shown me is, is this. If God can find the people who are completely and utterly surrendered, utterly baptised into Christ, which we are, but actually begin to walk in it, begin to realise it, begin to get a revelation of it, that we are baptised into his death, not just his death, but into his resurrection power. Amen. I think in the past we've preached a lot about death to self, and I do it as well, but it's not just for the sake of being dead to self. It's not just so that we walk about and you're dead. It's so that you become alive into the full stature, the full nature of God, the full divine nature. And I think it's this part that we've never realised. And I'm convinced that as we begin to walk in a level where we are dead, when you begin to die to your sinful ways in our own life, or let's take it to the church level, I believe part of this death is dying to our own programmes. Dying to our own ways, dying to our own strategies, dying to how we think we can win a region or win a nation or how we can evangelise or how we do church. We've got to be totally dead to that because Christ did not have his way. He did not have good ideas or programmes. Christ was only doing what he saw the Father doing. He was dead to his ways in every way. And I believe the church in this region, the church in this nation, the church global, the body of Christ has to be completely dead to our ways, to our programmes, to how we think we're going to win Scotland, to how we think we're going to win the UK, to how we think we're going to win different regions in the world. And if we are completely dead to self, which is a work of grace, it's, I'm not talking about legalism, I'm not talking about self-effort, I'm not talking about our ability to die. It's his ability that enables us to die. It's us being baptised into that death, into the cross, so that we can live a resurrected life. But if he can find a group of people, a remnant, a remnant, that's why it's been cut back. Because it's not everyone who wants us. It's not everyone who's willing to be completely dead. It's not everyone who's willing to completely yield. Like when you see it through the generations like Smith Wigglesworth or Kathleen Kuhlman or, or various people, it's glorious. When people say, like Kathleen, she says, I'll take you to the place where Kathleen died. How is it they had open heavens? Was it their efforts or programs? No, it's because they were baptised in Christ. When Jesus was baptised, the heavens open. We're looking for revival. How's it going to happen? I'm telling you, God's just looking for one or two people who are completely dead. One. God's just looking for one person. And I'm not talking about self-effort. Please don't hear me wrong. I'm not talking about us trying to be holy. There's a false holiness. There's a legalistic holiness and it stinks. And it's about how you dress and what... what um, make up you wear, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> That's not holiness. I'm talking about us sitting and you turn into Christ, you spend time with him, and inside you're transformed, you're transfigured, you're changed from glory to glory. As you spend time with him in that secret place, he transforms you into the place of death first. In other words, he challenges every single area of your life that's alive to sin, or alive to the ways of the world, or alive to the culture of the earth. And he's looking for one or two, like Jesus, who are, being, who are willing to be totally baptised into death so that the heavens can open. And then the Father speaks and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, the Father sees a group of people on the earth and goes, that's what I'm looking for. I can move on that because I see what they've got. They're dead. I can move on that because they're not about to do their own thing. They're not getting involved with their own agendas. They're not trying to build churches. We think the world needs us. We are building a seeker sensitive type church because we think we've got to be relevant to the culture. We don't need to be relevant to the culture. We need to be dead to the culture. We don't need to be relevant to the, our day and age. We need to be dead to the, our day and age, the ways of the world. We need to be dead so that if we can be ones who are totally surrendered and yielded, then as we are just simply dead, the heavens opened. The heavens opened when Jesus was baptised. 
The heavens will open when anybody's dead and then live in resurrected life. This is beyond revival. This is actually God's ultimate plan for his body on the earth, is that we are dead but then alive. And when you live in that place of being alive, the resurrection life pulsating through your body, the divine nature, the divine power, the divine glory, the fear of God, that realm of holiness, as we walk in that, you can have revival the rest of your days. And I believe there's a generation that's going to walk in revival the rest of our days. It's not going to be just two years, three years, four years. Why? Because we can be ones who are totally dead and then totally alive. That's the first part I wanted to just mention. And then it takes me on to the second part about holiness. Because by being baptised into his death... We are raised again to partake in the resurrection life of Christ, which includes partaking in his holiness. When I've been seeking God this past two, three, four years or whatever, I'm asking God, what's missing? And one of the things that is missing is holiness. And I want to just talk just a little bit about that. And again, I want to emphasise I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about wearing funny clothes and no wearing, wearing hats or no hats and all of that. I'm talking about something else. 1 Peter 2 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You see, we are a holy nation. A holy people, kings and priests. But what does holiness really mean? Let me just read out something else first before I go on to that. But you are God's chosen treasure. This is the Passion Translation of the same verse. But you are God's chosen treasure, priests who are kings. A spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvellous light, and now he claims you as his own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. There's something about being set apart. There's something about a remnant that God's looking for, a holy nation. And God, I believe, has chosen people here. I believe he's chosen people all across this land in different parts of the world who he wants to bring apart right now. And I believe that's why there's been a separation to do with the COVID. I believe that's why a lot of people have not come back. Because God is setting apart a remnant and not everybody is part of it. And it's not because God has excluded them. I believe we decide whether we're going to be part of it or not. Because it's up to us whether we want to go further. It's up to us whether we want to go deeper. It's up to us whether we stay in of courts or go step by step into the Holy of Holies. And I'm convinced if God can find a group of people, one person, as Alex says, just one person who says, Lord, I don't even understand this. I don't know what it means to be holy. I don't know what it means to be set apart. But I want to be set apart. I want to be set apart. I know that I'm born for this. And I know that you're born for this. We're born into this day. We're born into this mess. But can God find a David that he can set apart? Can God find a Moses? Can God find... It's even greater than that because we've got Christ in us. They had God with them. We've got Christ in us. Do you know, we can see something even greater than what Moses saw. He split the sea. That's not the greatest thing that's going to happen. Wealth revival is not the greatest thing that happened. The lowest revival is not the greatest thing that can happen. A group of Christ-like ones, holy ones, set-apart ones... The world has never seen this. We've seen one or two people here or there who have been set apart. One or two people who paid the price. One or two people who were yielded vessels. Just one or two. But what would happen if there's a, a body, an army, like Bill's group on a Wednesday, an army of people across the planet? Not our ways, not our plans, not our programs, but dead, but then resurrected, walking in the resurrection power. Fullness. I love Proverbs 9.10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. 
the fear of the Lord. We don't even have the beginning of anything if we don't have the fear of the Lord. They had the fear of the Lord in the Isle of Lewis when hundreds of people were run out of their houses because God came to the region. Knowledge of the holy is understanding. Do you know, I don't want just knowledge. There's too much just knowledge in the church that we just learn theology, we just learn head knowledge. I want the knowledge of the holy. I don't think we really know him. I don't think we really know him. He is so powerful, he's so glorious, he's so mighty, and he wants to make himself known through a bunch of remnant people. But it takes hunger, it takes us saying today, I want the knowledge of the holy. What does it mean to have the knowledge of the holy? Bible kind of knowledge is not the same kind of knowledge we've got. It's not just understanding in the mind. Knowledge is experiential. In other words, I want to experience the holy. I've heard about it. You've heard about it in revivals. You've heard about it in, in the past when God's moved and people experience the realm of holiness that came. But I want to experience it. So what is holiness? And I'm not saying today that I've got all the whole answer about holiness exactly what it is. And I can only give you a small part of what it is and, and just hopefully you've got a desire to know what it is. Because I'm convinced, utterly convinced, the Lord is speaking, he's shouting, he's crying, saying, who will come aside? What ones of us will come aside and say, oh, I cannot, we cannot be like this anymore? We cannot be like this anymore. That's why I honour Alex and Charlotte. You have came aside. Like, your, your nightly meetings. That's coming aside. It's saying, Lord, we need you. We, we're waiting on God. So the word for holiness is apodes. No, sorry, codes. I might not say it properly. Kodesh, whatever. A word that highlights the realm of the sacred. The realm of the sacred. Holiness is not just behaviour, it's the realm of the sacred. Can you imagine, and this is what probably revival has been in the past, a realm of the sacred comes amongst us. I want to experience that. I don't want to just read about it anymore. I don't want to just read about the worst revival and different revivals and sing about it, although I, I do, I still love singing about it and I still read. I want to experience the realm of the holy. And you know the way has been opened through the cross through Christ because the veil has been torn and we actually have access into the realm of the most holy place. This is not just theoretical, it's not just an idea. We can actually come into the very realms of holiness. So it's not just behaviour, it's actually a realm. Holy refers to God and what belongs to him. Um, where was I? Yeah. It comes from the Hebrew word Kodesh, which means to cut. To be holy means to be cut off, separate from everything else. It means to be in a class of your own, distinct from anything that has ever existed or will ever exist. And it also means this second other thing. It means to be holy, means to be entirely morally pure. All the time and in every possible way. It means to be cut off, separate, high above everything. It means to be completely set apart, completely different. And actually it means completely divine, completely God-like, completely Christ-like. But it also means to be completely morally pure. And the scripture says, be ye holy, as I am holy. What does that even mean? You know, God is actually saying, you can be as holy as God. <laughs> you can be morally, completely pure. As I like talks about John Wesley, was that he believed you could be completely perfect. Is that right? Sin free. Sin free. It's like the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers were there, it says, until we walk in the full stature of Christ. 
until we become the perfect man. There's something beyond anywhere we have been. It's beyond visitation, it's habitation. It's us becoming completely morally pure. Otherwise, God, the scripture would never have said, be ye holy, be ye set apart, be ye cut. Sometimes that means be cut to the heart first. This past year, I feel I've been cut to the heart. Like we've got to be cut to the heart. Why? Because you're being separated unto God, not just separated from sin. You're being separated unto God, unto his holiness. We've been set above. We've been set above, seated with him in, in, in the realm of holiness, because he is holy. And we can become completely morally pure. In other words, sin cannot touch us, it cannot hold us, it cannot pull us down. The ways of the world, the sinful ways that always held us back, there is a place in God where we can become holy. Otherwise, he would never have said, be holy as he is holy. And I also believe that that holiness, that there is not just a command, it's actually an, an invitation for impartation. Because it's actually like the Lord saying, be made holy. I believe as we spend place in that place of that realm of holiness, the holy of holies, the most holy place, you get impartation. Why? Because it says as we behold him as in a mirror, we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. As we spend time in prayer, in silent prayer and meditation, in the place of silence, you're transformed from one degree of glory to another. In other words, from one degree of holiness to another degree of holiness. Because there's the holy place, then there's the most holy place. That's different levels of holiness. And that only comes through separation. It only comes through being cut. It only comes through being separated unto God. It only comes by a people who've decided we want it. And I tell you what, if you decide you want it, God works with us. He begins to change you. I'm not saying it happens quickly. It doesn't. God's not in a hurry. He's outside time. He takes years, decades even, to shape us and mould us into his image. But he's looking, looking for those that he can cut to the heart. It can be painful. It can include a lot of suffering. In fact, it usually does. And it's usually a message we don't like. The fact we need to go through suffering. Through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. In other words, through much suffering, we enter the dominion of the king. Can you imagine there's a place where there's no sin that it can hold us ever because you're completely and utterly morally pure? And I'm not talking about outside, outward behaviour. I'm talking about an inward transformation because of grace, because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, the Spirit of God is working in me mightily. Grace works in me mightily. That resurrection power, it's not just us getting a touch in a meeting where we feel revival. It's the resurrection spirit, the power of God in us, working in us, changing us, so that there's a remnant on earth that's never been seen. A remnant on earth that's never been seen. It's not just revival. It's resurrected ones. Those who are dead, but they're experiencing the resurrection spirit of God. This is a quote from someone called Jeff, Jerry Bridges. I don't actually know who they are, but I like the quote. It says, many Christians of what we might call a cultural holiness. They adapt to the character and behaviour pattern of Christians around them. But God has not called us to be like these people around us. He has called us to be like himself. Holiness is nothing less than conformity to the character of God. I think the biggest problem, if I can say this, in the church is we copy each other. We copy nice churches or good churches in America. And listen, I love a lot of the churches that I'm even thinking about. But we're not to conform to the image of a church. We're not to conform to the image of a culture. It's not to be cultural holiness. We have to be holy. We have to see God. We have to be conformed into the very character of God. If we just copy, then all we'll get is what the other churches have got. And it might be, it looks like success. It looks good. It looks 
pretty exciting sometimes. But from God's point of view, it's not actually success. Success isn't just having a building filled with people. True success is having people filled with God. Christ-like people. I remember going to wee meetings when I was younger, and maybe you would have a dozen people in, in a wee meeting, and but they were filled with God. And the realm of holiness in the room was tangible. And when you started worshipping, a spirit of worship would come. Why? Because two or three people gathered in his name. He is in the midst. We don't even know what that means. We think it just means two or three people gathering and saying the name of Jesus. It's not. A name is about character. Like Isaac becoming, sorry, Jacob becoming Israel. In other words, a change of name is actually a change of character. And when we come in the name of Jesus, it doesn't say when you come and say the name. It says when you come in his name. In other words, when we come in the character of God, when you get two or three people coming in the character of God, the nature of God, who come in that realm of holiness is already there because they've been in that place of holiness in the secret place. They've been in that realm of prayer in the secret place. They've been with the divine. They've been with Christ. They have been transformed. They've been through the fire. They've been through suffering. They've been through stuff. They've been shaped and formed by Christ himself. When they've been shaped and formed by Christ himself and they gather together together, there am I in the midst. There's a realm of holiness I experienced when I was younger, but I believe there's far more to come. It's going to be far greater. Christ will be master of the heart, this is Charles Spurgeon. And sin must be mortified. If your life is unholy, then your heart is unchanged. And you are an unsafe person. The Saviour will sanctify his people, renew them, give them a hatred of sin and a love of holiness. The grace that does not make a man better than others is a worthless counterfeit. Christ saves his people, not in their sins, but from their sins. Without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. We don't want to see the Lord. We don't want to see revival. We don't want to see an outpouring. But without holiness, we shall not see God. There's only there's a realm of God that's kept, if you like, from us until we're holy. Now we can see a realm, maybe a visitation, we can maybe see an outpour, we can maybe see like the movings of the spirit. But if we want to see God personally, corporately, regionally, nationally, we've got to be holy. Because there's a realm of God when it comes in that way. If we're not holy, we would actually die. There's a fear of God coming like that. Like Ananias and Sapphira. See, they had the realm of that holiness with them in the early church. And we think, how did Ananias and Sapphira suffer like that? Why? Because that realm of holiness. So that's why God has not came in that realm. It's actually out of mercy. But he wants to come like that. He wants to come like that. But it only comes through those who are dead, baptised, living in the resurrected life, living in a place of holiness. And I, I must emphasise, I'm not talking about our self-effort. I'm talking about being transformed. None of us can reach it and their own ability. None of us can do it with our own effort, so don't feel condemned. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about getting before him in the secret place and letting him transform us. All we've got really is our hunger, our desire. We've got a... Whatever God... This is A.W. Tozer. Whatever God felt about anything... See, this is holiness. It's totally being in complete agreement with God no matter what culture says. We cannot become the same as our culture. Whatever God felt about anything, he still feels. Whatever he thought about anyone, he still thinks. 
Whatever he approved, he still approves. Whatever he condemned, he still condemns. Today we have what we call the relativity of morals. But remember this, God never changes. Holiness and righteousness are conformity to the will of God. And the will of God never changes for moral creatures. If we're going to be set apart, we cannot change the Bible because we don't like the way God has been sometimes. And it is, believe me, it's happening. I read something on Facebook the other day that I think I spoke to Bill a little bit about it. It's unbelievable what people are beginning to believe. It's unbelievable. But it all comes from our culture influencing us because we begin to think, well, we were a bit old-fashioned way back then. God's not really like that. He's a God of love. So he's, he doesn't really mind, I don't know, whatever you want to mention. Homosexual marriages or whatever. He's okay with that now. You know, if we're going to be holy, we have to be totally against everything that God says is wrong. And I'm not talking about being foolish and going out and shouting my mouth off or whatever. I'm just saying inwardly, we've got to believe. And at the right time, we've got to make a stand. Why? Because we've got to be holy. We've got to be separate. We've got to be cut away from the ways of the world. We've got to believe what God believes. If we're going to see God, we've got to be holy. God's looking for a realm of holiness on earth. He's looking for a people where he can visit in a way that he's maybe never visited in generations. Every now and again, there's been a, a generation that's received something of this realm. I believe it happened in Lewis. They had something of the realm of the holiness of God. And I know God can move in different ways, absolutely, but it's still got to contain that realm of holiness. It's still got to transform us. It's still got to change us. And I'm just longing for that realm of God because it's that realm of God that comes and whole regions are saved. Like, can you imagine that realm of holiness where we ourselves have entered into a place of God where we're totally dead to self, we're living a resurrected life, that realm of holiness is in us, permeating from us. Hugh Black would call it the emanation of Christ. Well, you're not even trying. You can just walk. I read it last night, actually, Smith Wigglesworth, when he went to America, I think it was Los Angeles. And the same happened to him that happened to Peter. They were queuing up down the road just to get near him. And they just wanted to get near his shadow. And they were putting people out on beds or cots or whatever they called them just to be near Smith Wigglesworth. And as soon as they get near his shadow, they were healed completely, instantly. Why? Because I believe as a realm of holiness it brings greater miracles. If we don't have that realm of holiness, we're actually just functioning out the gifts. Where it's it's like the gifts are without repentance. You could actually live the way you any way you wanted, but the gifts will still work. But there's a realm of holiness where there's greater manifestation. There's a realm of holiness where there's greater power. There's a realm of holiness where there's a greater authority. Why? Because you're in complete union with God, that's why. It's not even just you speaking, it's actually him speaking through you. There's a difference. Oftentimes we present God through our ideas about God, but there's a difference from that than speaking as an oracle. In other words, you're in union with God and he speaks through you. And when he speaks through you, he backs up his own word with signs and wonders. He backs up his own word. Why? Because it's not your words he's backing up. He's not going to back me. But he backs him speaking through me. Holiness is to be separated from the world's values and cultural norms and to be conformed into the image of who God is. When you see someone, and I think we've all met one or two people through, down through the ages who is holy, and it's so beautiful. When you see someone like that and they are holy, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. You want to be with them. You want to spend time with them because they're walking in another realm. They know God. Well, it's probably like the two old ladies in Lewis. Duncan Campbell said they just wanted to be near them because they knew God better than him. They knew God. They knew what God wanted to do. They knew God's plans. Like, they would send, they told the minister, send for Duncan Campbell. And then Duncan Campbell wrote a letter back saying he couldn't make it. He's got a conference or whatever it was. And they said, ah, oh, he'll be here within a fortnight. 
And he was. Because they knew God. They lived in another realm. They were separated. They were cut off. Yeah, they were ill. But they were cut off. Sanctification means, this is Oswald Chambers, the impartation of the holy qualities of Jesus Christ. I love that. Sanctification means the impartation of the holy qualities of Jesus Christ. It is his patience, his love, his holiness, his faith, his purity, his godliness that is manifested and through every sanctified soul Sanctification is not drawing from Jesus the power to be holy. It is drawing from Jesus the holiness that was manifested in him and he manifests it in me. In other words, sanctification is not just something you get from him, it's getting him. It's getting the qualities of who he is. You're getting all that he is, the love, the patience, the kindness, the faith, the holiness, the apartness, the separateness. It's the qualities of Christ. It's walking in the full stature of Christ. It's being divine. It's actually us being participating of the divine nature. I don't know about you, but what would happen if there was a group of people in this nation who participated in the divine nature? You see, all the promises in God are yes and amen. We read these scriptures and we go, that's lovely. But how many people are actually functioning and walking out the divine nature so that it's beyond anything we've seen. I love this scripture. Because I was asking about the power. Where, where is the power? Like, there's been people running about me who didn't get healed of different things. I think we've all experienced that. And it's been heartbreaking because you're praying and you don't see the power. Let me just read this. Romans 1, 3-4 says... Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Let me just read it from the Passion Translation. It says, for the gospel is all about God's son. As a man, he descended from David's royal lineage. But as the mighty son of God, he was raised from the dead and miraculously set apart with a display of triumphant triumphant power supplied by the spirit of holiness. And now Jesus is our Lord and our Messiah. And we can just read that as that's what happened to Jesus, but this is also what happens to us. The mighty son of God, we are the sons, was raised from the dead. We get raised from the dead with Christ. And miraculously set apart holiness. With a display of triumphant power. The power of God that we're all looking for. The power of God to live holy, to live righteously, to live sin free, to live pure. To live as the perfect man. To live seated in heavenly realms. With the display of triumphant power supplied, this is all supplied by the spirit of holiness. As we engage the spirit of holiness, it's the spirit of holiness that imparts the power of the resurrection. We're looking for revival, but actually we should really be looking, and I'm all of revival, we should be looking for the spirit of holiness engaging us so that we live in the power of the resurrection. And it's only through the spirit of holiness that we can experience the same as Christ. You see, we have to be dead with Christ, but also raised with him. You see, this is the gospel. The gospel isn't just that he died for our sins, it's he died so that we could be dead and live a resurrected life here and now. So that we could be seated in heavenly places in reality, not just theory. So that we could govern as kings and priests. Governmentally, over regions, over nations. But it only happens as the spirit of holiness is amongst us. And as we are changed from glory 
to glory. As we become Christ-like, as we participate of the divine nature. I've got so much here, but I don't want to go through it all because I know that sometimes you just say enough, don't you? I really believe there's a realm of holiness God wants to take us all into. It's a realm of separation. It's where we are separated. It's not legalism. It's not us trying to outwardly behave properly. It's a realm of God where we enter into that place of the holy of holies, prayer, secret place, taking time with him, allowing him to transform us inwardly from glory to glory, where that spirit of holiness comes, where we are dead to self, where he helps us, enables us through grace to die to self completely so that then we can live in a place called resurrection life, where we can walk in the power of the age to come, where we can walk in that realm of God where there's a whole region under that same glory. Because Christ was baptized, then the heavens opened. And there's that realm of holiness that we can walk in. When that realm opens, it's not just us that benefits It's a whole region that benefits. And if God can find amongst us, just two or three or just one, people who just say yes, Lord, to this and don't feel condemnation because we can't do it. (laughs) But what God wanted, wanted to happen to us is three levels, if you like, the outer court, the holy place and the most holy place. I, I believe most churches live in the outer courts where we're actually doing everything in our own effort. We're trying our own ways. We're trying to conform to the culture of the earth, trying to be seeker-sensitive, trying to be relevant to our culture. Then there's those who come a bit deeper into the holy place. They maybe experience a bit of God. There's a bit of movement to the spirit of God. There's gifts flowing maybe. And we can settle there. But for those, and I believe it's a remnant, come further, come deeper into the most holy place where you yourself are not just preaching a message that you think God is happy with. We're not just preaching about Christ but you're actually preaching Christ. Do you know, I believe that's the difference between our generation and the early church. We preach about Christ. They preached Christ. In other words, he was manifest. We preach nice teachings about him. We have nice stories, nice background, nice history, nice points to take from the story. They preached Christ. He was manifest. Their shadows healed. People were convicted. 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost were cut to the heart. Because Christ was manifest. That realm of holiness was manifest. We don't manifest him. We speak about him a lot. But if we come deeper into the place of the most holy place, we will be transformed. We will experience the spirit of holiness that will impart that power of the resurrection so that we can walk in the resurrection power and begin to live out of another realm. Begin to live out of that realm of the heavenlies where you are seated theologically, but in practice we might not function there. But it all comes from just desire. And I don't know about you, but I want it. I want that realm of holiness. I think Lewis, the Hebrides, experienced just a touch of it. But it will come only just like that, the first story in the baptism of Jesus, only from those who are willing to be truly baptised into his death. Then resurrected up again into newness of life. Then the heavens open. Thanks, Stevie.